Welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is Jennifer Snyder. I am a program coordinator with the SUNY Center for Professional Development, and I'd like to welcome you to our first uh, webinar of the Empowering Every Voice series featuring SUNY um, presenters from across the SUNY system uh, talking about academic and personal development of our students. I'd like to turn it over to Cheryl Hamilton, uh, the Associate Vice Chancellor for Student Life, Opportunity Programs, and Student Advocate to get started. Thank you so much, Jen, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, very exciting to see all of you, and I am so honored and pleased to introduce to you our very first presenter for the Empowering Every Student Voice webinar series. Karima Leggett currently serves as the Director of the Educational Opportunity Program at Binghamton University. Karima earned her degree, her, her undergraduate degree in human geography and a master's degree in urban geography from Binghamton University. Her research interests encompass the intricate intersections of race, ethnicity, and place, complemented by a deep-seated fascination with transformative leadership. Um, I have had the privilege of working closely with Karima for many years. I will share that she is a student-centered leader. She is very well-versed in the unique needs of first-generation college students and has also uh, developed some incredible strategies for supporting their success. I can talk all day about Karima, but I wanna make sure you have enough time to hear from her. So it is my pleasure again to present to you Karima Leggett. Thank you. Okay, now this is the testament to do this, right? Can I do that right? Okay. Thank you so much. I'm elated to be a part of this webinar series, especially the focus on empowering voices, right? As a reserved and quiet leader, and sometimes antisocial extrovert. Um, I appreciate the welcome uh, to share my experience. And I hope to add some new ideas to the conversation about first-generation students, maybe uh, just a few reminders, or even to inspire some future research um, on this journey, a journey that has the power to change entire lives and communities. And we, we know that this is what happens extremely well. So good afternoon to all of you, and thank you for being here. So I was about 10 years old when I came across this television show. I'm not sure if you've heard of it, but it took place on a fictional historically Black college called Hillman. Okay, so some of you know. Uh, a Different World was a sitcom from the late 1900s, as my students describe it. It was the late 80s, so 87, 88, but it was an eye-opening, jaw-dropping, and fun-loving insight into college life, right? I wanted to grow up so that I could be a student at a place like Hillman and live in a carefully crafted, you know, community with other grown-up students who had plans and dreams to do great things after college, right? Um, but it was this one part that stuck with me, right? It was the song. It, it left a little bit of confusion with me. It was quite harrowing. And by season two, the song was belted out by the beautiful Aretha Franklin. And this is what she said. I know my parents love me. Stand behind me come what may. I know that now I'm ready. Yeah, for I finally heard them say, it's a different world, ooh, than where you come from. Yes, it is. Here's our chance to make it as we focus on our goals. You can dish it, we can take it. Just remember, you've been told. It's a different world than where you come from, right? Ooh, a little scary. Um, while there was this immediate affectionate tone acknowledging the importance of the unwavering support of your family, that they were always gonna have your back, it was different than where you come from is the part that stuck with me. And I didn't get it at the time, but again, the song was so catchy. It never left my mind. I would see a different world for years, many years to come. 
In fact, when it went to syndication or went to Netflix, um, students were reintroduced to a different world and they truly did enjoy it. I just don't know if the song stuck with them the way it stuck with me. I am the eldest of three. I'm the eldest of three. Um, and like many families that made up the, my community, my parents both worked a minimum of two jobs most of the time to provide for our family of five. Plus, um, because we were constantly caring for other family members, friends, and even strangers, um, as a well-behaved child, I didn't really have many issues in school. I was challenged at the time by um, predominantly Black teachers and administrators who were phenomenal role models in Brooklyn's PS183 and Philippa Schuyler's IS398. Um, I enjoyed school very much until high school when my family moved upstate New York. And when I say upstate, I mean the real upstate, two hours beyond Westchester County, right? I began the ninth grade at a predominantly white high school where there were no black or Latina teachers at my suburban school. And because I was a black student, but not an athlete, I was largely ignored by most teachers and administrators. Most of them wished me well, but for the most part, I just skated by. Um, and as the school district was coming to terms with the changing demographics of the area, I struggled to find my voice and I accepted new identities that were thrown at me like at risk, urban, poor black student, free lunch recipient from the ghetto. And it was really interesting because I never considered my family to be poor because we always had what we needed or so I thought. Um, there were always others around that had far less. Um, but in this space, I felt poor every day. The socioeconomic exclusivity among the student body was stark and vivid. This was different. I was different. Um, so as my parents prepared to leave high school for college, um, I began to think, as many people encouraged me to, about the good jobs um, that I would be able to get with my Regents diploma and help my family. But I truly did want a different world. And at the push of a friend who lent me her word processor at night, I applied to college. And so this is me in 1996, just before my first semester at Binghamton University. I was admitted to Binghamton through the Educational Opportunity Program, and I had no idea what that meant. Uh, but I knew that I was stepping into something again that was different. And thank goodness for my pre-freshman summer bridge experience. Like many students in my cohort, I was the first in my family to go to college. In fact, I was the first on my block to go to college. Um, and graduate, but that was normal in my circles, or so I thought. I thought we were the same. Going to college meant the freedom to explore and enjoy my academic prowess, um, but I have so much to owe to, to my family. Um, they didn't know what I needed, but they would show up with love as long as they were near to support me and my, my peers um, in college. Um, and I met some fantastic people and had some grand experiences, but I always carried some guilt um, leaving for college because I was this person who worked a job since the age of eight, 18, 13, since it was legal, um, to help pay a bill. You know, if you wanted cable, you have to contribute to this bill. Or if you're going to do this, you, you need to contribute to this. So I would work and hand my check over um, and I was excited to do that, right? I was excited to take on that responsibility, but, but I just thought it was normal. I thought everyone was doing that. Um, and so to, to leave that and be able to think about me and myself and be a bit selfish um, was pretty grand. Um, I thought, here's my chance to make it like that song said. Um, unfortunately, I was not always welcome. A lot of the ideas that I ran into as a Black woman um, on this campus 
um, told me that I didn't belong here or that I had taken a seat from someone who was more deserving. And I internalized that as did some of my peers. Um, I arrived um, at Binghamton with competing identities, longing for academic recognition. I just wanted somebody to see me and to, to see how good I was and, you know, to encourage me to, to do more, like to try harder, to be better. Um, but I was never championing, championing my first generation status. Um, it was almost like I couldn't get to that bullet, you know, the last bullet on this slide. So I was a Black female from a financially challenging background, educated in the public school system, beginning in Brownsville, Brooklyn, of, of uh, all neighborhoods. Um, I was a public housing resident there and upstate. And I, I, could, I never could get to that bullet. It's just, it wasn't, I wasn't allowed um, to express that as my identity. And I think embracing it would have presented a challenge for me because I just couldn't wipe my mind of the brilliant kin in my ancestral line who were forbidden to learn to read or even killed for doing so, right? So I'm the first in my family to get to college because of systemic racism and the things that exist in this world that we live in. And that, that didn't feel good either. Um, because I just knew so many other students in my neighborhood or friends, family members who deserved the spot the same way that I did. I put these two pictures up here just to show first generation then and first generation now. Um, these are students who attended Binghamton University. And I think it's important to kind of capture the history like we were first generation students, you know, what people saw when they looked at us may have been all of these other things, but we deserve that support. And um, it's a reminder that I share with students often. Here's an image of some of them walking, you know, from class down the walkway on campus. And I like to show them images of folks who were doing the similar things at similar spaces on the Binghamton University campus so that they can connect to that past. Like those folks dreamed of you here. And that's a quote that is often shared um, in my professional spaces in EOP. Um, and it's, it's jarring, it's so moving. I think the students are encouraged by that. Like, oh, okay, so this is hard, but it's been hard, right? This is a challenge, but it's supposed to be a challenge. And even though the collegiate landscape has shifted since, since those days, um, in grand ways, many colleges are eager to broaden and diversify their enrollments to improve access and equity retention graduation rates um, and paying attention to their educational and societal mission which is crucial we know that higher education is seeking more effective ways to help and support and many folks who are here today are looking to sort of find out how they can do that as well um, and you know, I hope to be able to express some of those things for us today. Um, we're leaning in. We understand that it takes more than just an open door to say, hey, come, you can get in now. Um, there's a little more that's going to have to be a part of this experience to ensure that our students are successful. So first things first, let's talk about definitions and um, this first generation student. The term first generation implies the possibility that a student may lack the critical cultural capital that's necessary for college success because their parents did not attend college. Uh, but this is, is not the same at every college. So at SUNY, we're, we're talking about students who neither uh, parents, neither biological parents attended college, right? Or um, their parents did not graduate from college. So maybe they went, they took some classes, but they didn't graduate. Or students whose parents did not graduate from a four-year college in the United States. Or students whose parents completed their degrees as non-traditional or post-traditional students over the age of 25. There's a lot in that. There's a lot of or. 
Um, and I think our students, when they get to this space, they're looking to step into those identi identities the same way that I was as a student. Um, but they're oftentimes competing identities. They're looking for that recognition, understanding that they are not a homogenous group. And we have to remember that. So when we're looking for ways to successfully interact, it's not going to be the same for every student, right? They all represent a variety of living experiences. But that's great. That's a great place to start. And the Council for Opportunity and Education has spearheaded an annual event to sort of celebrate these identities, right? So every November 8th is First Generation College Celebration Day to acknowledge and elevate first generation college students and alumni um, and their contributions to encourage communities to better understand, this part is interesting, the systemic barriers plaguing higher education and the support necessary for this critical and resilient population to continue to thrive, right? I think it's so powerful. It reminds me of the time I spent as associate director for the TRIO, Ronald E. McNair Post-Baccalaureate Achievement Program. That community gave all the identities this opportunity to um, express, grow, learn, and represent this program. So first-gen, low-income, underrepresented students, right? All of that. Um, and I think that is the area, that is the sort of the time where I paid most attention to those individual um, communities and what they represent, how they are not alike, and the things that they all struggle with. But you know, there's diversity within that diversity, right? And so now, as a leader in the Educational Opportunity Program, we're paying attention to transfer students, right? First-generation transfer students, first-generation foster youth, post-traditional students, homeless students, neurodivergent students, um, those learning difference, first generation is not mutually exclusive. And the barriers for some may not be the barriers for others, right? So the only way that we know is to ask, right? To learn and to connect. I, I wanna include this slide here, um, for example, Black first-generation college students are likely to arrive at universities uninformed about uh, that identity because it's an inv invisible identity, right? People see something else. Um, ironically, Black college students are hyper-visible in the media and in popular culture, yet they're un underrepresented on college campuses across the nation, right? Um, we know that gender, orientation, ability, religion, social class are all intersecting identities for Black first-generation college students. But because they are Black, folks make a lot of assumptions, right? And that's natural because our brain wants to categorize and generalize, right, when we look at certain NC groups. But we know that there are critical differences among immigrant and U.S born Black college students. Um, we know that the data shows that um, student loan debt disproportionately impacts them, especially women. And I'm a living testament to that, even as a SUNY alum. Um, family engagement, whether that's extended relations, aunties, cousins, and them. Uh, the conversation about leaving home and going to college is a calculated one due to the responsibilities that, that uh, you may have at home. Um, I had to talk to a lot of people, not just my parents, to say that I was leaving and this is what I was doing. Um, but that that conversation becomes different when we pull in religion, um, when we pull in ability. It is also well documented that students of color and low income students are less likely to seek support, whether it's for cognitive or mental health disabilities or or even just tutoring. Um, we know that they have this, I'm going to do it for me. I'm going to thug it out, um, which is which is something that we don't expect them to do in college, right? We want them to come in. We want them to, to apply for high impact 
um, practices such as studying abroad, fellowships, internships, service learning opportunities. Um, the research on the Black first generation uh, college student is fair. And if you'd like to see it or see more, um, the Center for First Generation College uh, Student Success is an initiative of NASPA and, it, and the firstgen.naspa.org is a great place to kind of start um, searching for the research that does exist, but it's definitely an area that needs to grow. Belonging. Belonging is a big deal, right? And when we tie in the business of belonging, we have the capacity to impact connection, persistence, retention, graduation, right? All of these rates that are super important today on, on in higher education. Um, the connection offers the support um, and the sense of camaraderie. The community is there to hold students accountable. They know that they belong here. They feel it. And their goal is to connect to the supports, right, that are here. That's the retention. That's that's the stuff that's going to keep them, um, enable them to return each semester. But if we're going to say that you belong here as a first generation student, we have to ensure that our students see that when they look around the campus. They see it when they look around your office if they're coming in for assistance. They see it on bulletin boards, on social media posts. Like they have to see themselves reflected. Um, but we don't want folks to overdo it either, right? Because that can feel a little weird. But we want people to be comfortable. We want them to be comfortable connecting and be, being able to explore all that is here for them on your college campus, like wherever it is. Um, you want them to feel that this is their school and that they're a part of it and there's room for them to grow. Uh, one of the things that my experience in EOP um, is able to do really well is establishing the core identity because it happens during the pre-freshman summer program. And so uh, the goal is to respect the diversity that our students arrive with, yes, anticipate it, but then to ch challenge it. And so I, I include this picture here because I love it. Um, gatherings like the one here at the Harper Quad on our camp campus during a challenging summer day was so, uh, oh yeah, that, it was that, it was that to, uh, to be able to see. It reminded me of Dr. Beverly Tatum's research and her book, um, Why Are All the Black Kids Sitting Together in the Cafeteria, right? And she talks about um, students looking for affinity groups as they develop in their identity and that these, these gatherings should not indicate exclusion or hostility of others that, that are different, um, but really it is a way for them to... Um, to, to, to find that sense of belonging on their campus, um, especially if it, it, it is a predominantly white campus and they don't see themselves often, but to be able to take time to connect, right? And so we'll see that at the beginning of our program. We have a four week program. We'll see that early on. And then we step in to challenge that, right? And it may be by, you know, uh, assigning assigning a new group or a new room or a new uh, counselor peer to peer uh, relationship because we're trying to get folks to expand those zones. We want you to be comfortable with more than just this small group on this campus because we know it's going to take a large web to keep our students here to keep them um, connected and engaging on the Binghamton University campus or your campus wherever it is. Um, within the system. But there's some reshaping of the first gen identity that has to happen often. Um, internally, we have to challenge our students' mindsets. They're used to blending in, right? Not causing trouble, not drawing attention to themselves, right? We know that, that that's not gonna work on the college uh, level. And it's really hard to survive that way. If you think like I'm doing this myself and it's only me, 
Um, we want to be able to reprogram that in the student's mind. It's not only you. You have a community here, and we want you to connect to that. I think there's so much strength in that. Um, encouraging our students to take ownership of what and how they learn is important um, because it's a powerful experience to be able to observe them sort of stepping into um, that person that they've been that they've been dying to be. Um, they've been complying throughout K through 12 um, experiences. And now that they're here, the question is what now? There's this assumption that um, because neither of your parents went to college and you were underprepared means that you are unqualified. And that's, tr that's not true. Uh, sure, you may have been underestimated, but there's some keen knowledge and experience that a first generation arrives on a college campus with. And so it's our job to help them recognize those areas of expertise, right? And how they can be useful here. And sometimes we just have to point it out to them. Like, oh, I see you do this thing really well. Um, maybe you'd be interested in this. You know, when a student says to me, it is what it is, I always push back on it very hard because that's not true. It's, it is only what they said it was, right? You get to determine what it's going to be. And so those assumptions are things that we have to break. And, you know, we, we do that. We do that directly um, for students because we want them to acknowledge that they can be someone, someone new. They don't have to be who they were told they had to be. Culturally relevant and sensitive approaches. So um, we may be working really hard with a student, right? And then they go home for a long weekend. <sighs> and bam, we're starting from scratch. And I know that this happens in many areas um, with folks who are working with students. Um, students are going back and forth. And some of the cultural differences may influence how they behave in your presence, on your campus, in your program. Um, it may influence their approach to learning, communication, their interactions with other peers if they're working in groups, or even with the faculty and staff, right? And so it, it takes time to develop and redevelop and in introducing these new behaviors. I had a student who was from Nigeria and he told me that, you know, Karima, I know that my grades could be stronger. Um, I just started slacking off after my parents moved to the United States because, you know, nobody pushed me. Like, I didn't have to. And so I work with that student to be like, okay, well, we need to turn, turn this back around. Um, and I was able to introduce him, connect him to other faculty, to other students who understood that, right? Because maybe they had a similar experience coming from um, migrating, immigrating to the United States, um, but they were able to, to get that student on track and he appreciated that, but it was because we approached it from, uh, with the cultural lens, right? Um, I think in classes or like in programs and workshops, when we're able to incorporate diverse perspectives and examples, like People listen, they perk up, they hear, oh, they're talking about something that I know really well. And like, maybe I should raise my hand for this. But something as simple as that can really ramp up a student's interest um, in a conversation, in a class, during reading assignments, papers. Um, it's, 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 a, it's a grand tactic um, and, and extremely useful. I just wanna share this one thing. Um, we can't make assumptions, right? So. I was walking someplace and there was a student sitting there and I said, hello. And they didn't respond. They kind of looked over both of their shoulders like, are you talking to me? <laughs> and, and I said, yes, I'm talking to you. And they said, do I know you from someplace? And I laughed because I understood it, right? This is a person like, I do not talk to strangers. I'm doing what I'm doing. I'm focused and like everything else is just like to the side, I'm not paying attention. Um, so I had a conversation with that person, like, listen, you're on a college campus, like you see me, like I'm I'm not here to do you any harm. Um, and we laughed about it, you know, as that student was graduating. And I was like, oh, we we almost missed out on, you know, a grand uh, mentor mentee relationship because you didn't want to say hi. Um, but it's things like that 
um, when we see them, if we can take the initiative to turn it into some something that the student can learn from, it is highly effective and extremely useful to that person. Like, it's okay. It's okay. <laughs> um, it's okay to say hi. When we look across our campuses, um, we can help to identify supportive spaces and gathering areas where students can socialize and be themselves and connect with other first-generation college students, right? Um, we have to encourage mentorship relationships, whether that's peer-to-peer -peer with, with other staff on the campus, um, faculty advising, like whatever it is, we have to connect these people um, to professionals, right? Because I, now I know this person, I can always go and ask them or they're gonna respond because I know this person. I'm not getting my information from another first gen who may not understand the process either, but we're able to go directly to the source to get information. Um, I, I think in my personal experience beyond EOP, I connected with any adult that wanted to talk to me because I just enjoyed those relationships with people. Um, and it was extremely useful. I had a fantastic advisor, um, SUNY Distinguished Professor Dr. John Frazier from the Geography Department, who always reminded me to celebrate the small achievements. Um, in fact, he had a grand gesture publicly um, celebrating one of my accomplishments um, by hanging a photo in the corridor of the department. And um, it was it was it was grand. It was great. I, I was e elated to see it um, hanging in the in the hallway. It said something like, uh, "Karima's journey be began here. Yours can too." Right? Simple. Um, but it was a space for me on a difficult day to go to and like kind of like, "Yeah, my journey started here. Okay, you could do this." Um, I didn't realize at the time how much of an inspir inspirational um, image it would be for my students. I have new students who find that area on campus and when they do, they, Karima, I saw your picture on the wall. My goodness, I took a picture with it. I told all of my friends that I know you, um, but, but they did just that. Like geography created a space, a supportive space for students to be seen. And I think if, um, if more people would do that across areas um, just to identify like, hey, this is, yeah, you're gonna be supported supported here. This is a safe space for you. Um, I thought it was pretty grand, so I wanted to share it. Thank you to Dr. John Frazier, you're phenomenal. Um, go outside is the other piece that I set here because, um, you know, students are outside and they can see you, you can engage with them in another uh, open and freer space than in the office or a classroom, you know, or an advising tutoring session, just, just being in areas. Hey, I'm going to the coffee shop. You wanna walk over? To, okay, let's go. Or even um, sometimes when there are extra and co-curricular activities happening on our campus that may be beyond work hours um, that we could go to and support. I know the students get a kick out of that, out of seeing, um, you know, their counselor or their advisor at, you know, the fashion show or the talent show or, you know, what, whatever it is where we could spend some real time with folks off of the clock is extremely appreciated by many first-gen students. Communication. Communication is essential for creating a sense of community among first-generation students. A powerful, uh, encouraging message will go a long way. Um, I try to do that often with my students, like, oh, this was a rough week or, you know, week four is always challenging. Let me send a message. And it's not, you know, come in because I received this report. It is just, hey, how you doing? Are you hanging in there? That sort of thing. Did you hear about the study abroad fair that's coming up? Or stop by so we could work on your application. Um, I had an idea. I need you to hear this. Come see me. Those sort of things that kind of like, okay, well, she wants me to come see, okay, let me go see this. Um, being able to sort of reach out, like I see you. 
Um, and often it's not what you say, but how you say it. That was something that my parents sort of drilled in my head as a young child. It's not what you say, but how you say it. Um, but if we are communicating clearly, then students will understand the expectation. And that clearly piece is the challenge. Oftentimes in my office, we're saying to student staff, hey, does this make sense? How would you say this to a peer? Is this effective? Um, because we can always be better at this, right? Communication is, is one of those spaces um, where we, we, we know it's gonna change, right? Especially if we're, we're reaching out to students who are constantly changing. Um, but, but just um, encouraging students to ask questions, right? We know this group is not always um, able to seek out support themselves. And so we want to encourage, you know, I need help or I have a question. No question is stupid, right? And people still carry that with them into college. And then there's, there's this one slide that I wanted to share here because I know that retention and persistence is probably an issue on every campus right now. Um, but what I've been paying close attention to for my first generation college students is the great deal of fear about choosing to go to college period, right? So there's a lot of guilt that, that students will carry with them because they know that they are uh, deepening the financial stress on the household, right? I'm already not there working and contributing in this way. And now I have this humongous bill and how am I getting help for this? How am I getting support for this? I don't wanna bother my parents. I hear that all of the time. But this is a burden, this is a barrier because it interferes with our students' focus and learn from the very, you know, before school starts, they're already concerned about this money, um, having this money on, on their mind. And it does some damage to the mental health of the student. And so this is something that we have to pay close attention to because we're always gonna fight for our first generation students and their financial needs. But we have to do we have to do more um, because it, it is impacting whether or not they return to our campus when they truly loved it and enjoyed it and were able to connect. But they have to make this decision about um, not not um, being a huge burden on others. Right. That's that's heavily on their minds. And so I just wanted to highlight that for us today, um, that they're always thinking about this, always. And then I just wanted to say that I take such pride in all first generation accomplishments of students. And like, it takes a lot to step into different worlds and different environments and, you know, to become the greatest version of yourself that you imagined as a 10 year old, right? Or even better than what you imagined as a 10 year old. And um, I'm just really excited um, for this area. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to get to my question slide um, just to see if there are folks who would love to continue this conversation and share a LinkedIn and my email address if you'd like to do that um, beyond today. So should I stop sharing? Either way is fine. It might be nice to keep your information up there just so people can get that in their okay. address books. <clears throat> we don't have any specific questions in the Q&A yet, okay. um, but Michael just put something in the chat that maybe we can start off with. Sure. Um, he says, it bothers me when some people say that you can't help everybody, all students. How do you feel about that? What do you tell students who struggle and fail? You can't help everybody. Hmm, that one's tough because that is probably something that I would not choose to say to a student. Like we can't, we can't help everybody. There's something I could do. There is something that I could do to impact this person to make sure that they understand that I value whatever their concern is. And if there's something that I have to like pull up or call somebody for, to help that person, I'm going to do it. Um, I think I think any little bit helps. 
So even if we had to say, I can't do this great thing for you today, but here's what I can do. And maybe like just turning it that way for the student, it's easier for them to hear. It's like, okay, I couldn't do that, but here, here's what I can. And for students who fail, I tell them, try, try again. Um, because I think failing is the best way to learn that that didn't work, right? I think a lot of folks are on here and they're researchers and they understand that, you know, oh, that was my hypothesis, that, that was not true. And so I try to do it another way. I told, I think I told students like, oh, you, you found all the ways how it's not going to happen, right? So you tried that already. Let's do this, right? When I, I believe there was a commercial that used to come on as I got ready for work and it was like um, something about insanity. Insanity meaning, meaning to try the same thing over and over again and it never working. And it's like, okay, we know it doesn't work. But, but this thing right here, we like just tweak that a little bit. That could be it. Like that could be the thing that makes it work for us today. So that's how I would sort of tackle the, those two things. Michael, thank, thank you for that. We do have another question. How do you encourage practitioners to continue inclusivity work when it may not be prioritized campus-wide? <laughs> Yeah, that's a tough B um, because I, I recognize the timing that it takes to be um, in support of folks, um, especially when it is not something that's supported on your campus and people are not counting those hours um, and counting th that time. Um, I think for me and for my staff, um, they they really feel great about making positive impacts on others. And I know that that's not everyone. Some of us are just like, okay, I've had enough for today, right? I will attempt to do this tomorrow or next week. I think if we are able to carve out some time when we can, that we should. And I think if we can support our, our teams and our staffs to give them some space to do that, to, to make it a part of their workday so that they can get it done, then we should do that. Um, I, I know all about the uh, stress and burden that comes with you know, trying to be available for um, the many students, younger staff, folks who need mentoring on the campus that it's a lot, it's a lot. I think carving carving out space and time. And when we can't, we have to say no. We have to say no. And like, I, I'll try to do this for you next week. Um, I have some students now who are just like, I never see you. And I'm like, I spent four days in Albany, but I'm here now. We can't meet today, but, you know, take a look at this. I'd like to see you early Monday or something like that. Um, and trying to trying to accommodate as much as we can but not to the detriment of ourselves. Okay, we have a couple more questions for you. Uh, Chris is asking, do you find that first gen students pull away from opportunities for autonomy? Are they more likely to fear autonomy because they fear, quote, doing it wrong? Do they tend to look for more structure, guidance, direction in the classroom? Mm. I think I would have a hard time generalizing on um, that response, but I have found that there are students who appreciate being told when and what to do. Like, I think you should start this now. And there are the others who are like, I'm so sick of people telling me what to do. Um, in EOP, during our summer program is extremely structured. We tell them when to do everything. And they can't wait for that to end because they, they want to feel, you know, uh, the independent college living experience, you know, once the fall begins. But we find that there are a lot of students who still want us to engage with them, to schedule their uh, mandatory study hours uh, nightly. And so we've begun to do that for those students. And I've said to our, all of them, like, you know that you were successful when you all did this. But some of you want to try it your own way, and, and I respect that. Try it. If it doesn't work, I think that you need to return to this 
And so we're offering um, our space uh, twice a week for four hours where we feed our students the same way that we would during a summer program and try to recreate um, that community learning um, experience for them because they know that it works. And so if you want to be told when to do, I will tell you what to do, right? I will set this calendar with you. I will send you reminders. My staff will do it as well um, because they are used to, uh, many people are used to being told what to do and when. And they just, they just, you know, I don't want to do this myself because I feel like I'm going to mess it up. Well, let's work on that, right? Because I, I think you need to learn how to make these decisions for yourself. This is not mandatory right now, but you know that it works. So let's let's talk about you showing up here at this time. This is your decision now. This is this is on you now. You are a full, um, a fully duly uh, engaged college student here. This is on you. And so everything that happens here is now based on your decision and not mine. And there's some empowerment in that too. Now we have a lot of questions coming in as you're, <laughs> as you're talking. Let's get to a couple more. Um, someone's asking, what is your approach to help students who are struggling with severe mental health conditions and thinking about dropping out? Yeah, that one's tough. I'm not a mental health professional, but I have a lot of friends who are. And I think, again, connecting a student to a name is important. On our campus, we have uh, mental health professionals who spend time in our office weekly. Um, and so it's easier for me to be like, hey, my friend is going to be here at this time. I need you to let me let me take you to where she's going to be. Um, and just walk the student right over. Um, there are times when students have asked me not to leave, to sort of sit in with them. And I'll do that for a little while, but I'm like, no, this is this space is for you and this person to remove myself. But we walk students, we call over for like emergency meetings in the counseling center, we'll walk a student over. Um, we'll do what we can to be sure that this person can can speak to someone um, again. We're not the office that um, is made up of the mental health professionals. And so our, our duty is to connect our student to that assistant. I don't wanna leave at five o'clock and like go home worrying about this person who I did not connect to a mental health professional. I'm not gonna sleep well. It's just not gonna happen. Um, but in any way, any way that I can, I'm going to try to make that connection. Hank is asking in regards to Michael's question that you previously answered uh, to expand on Michael's concern. What are the ways we can find those students who may not be supported by other areas of the university and are not on our radar? They are uneasy coming to us or reaching out for encouragement slash help. Yeah. Oh, that's a good one. And right in front of me, I have like a little flyer thingy with my, my name, my picture. I told them to put a QR code just to make it easier for students, but they didn't listen. But they listed my contact information and how I could be helpful. Because again, I don't necessarily know that there is someone out there that needs me. Um, but if they can see my information posted and available at different places across the campus or as they engage in other spaces. Um, I think we have to do that. I remember there being a rule against like quarter sheets when I was a student, like you can't take the quarter sheets and like kind of just throw them all over. But we would pick them up back, back in the day, like, oh, did you see this? Um, but we have social media. We have so many other avenues to sort of get get the word out that there is assistance for you. I was talking recently about how we say, how, how we uh, introduce ourselves to students, right? So you can't just say like, oh, are you, do you need help? Go talk to this person. We got to make it direct to the student in order for them to hear it. We have to make it attractive in order for them to pay attention to it. Like we have to do more to uh, capture their focus and attention. And it's like, this. there's this one thing that you need to know and Karima can help. Or any, any way that we can, we have to do more to kind of grapple for that attention 
to make sure that students know that there's these services. I think the peer to peer, the, the students do that um, well themselves. Someone sent me a message and was like, oh, I heard that you were the homeless liaison. Um, I said, who told you that? Like, you know, like, how'd you find that? And they said, oh, my friend on Reddit. And I'm like, okay, this is great. Like the students are there um, and we can use them as well to make sure that other folks are exposed to the many resources. There are so many resources um, that are available across the campus and students just don't know about them. So we have to highlight them for, we have to highlight the resource for the students. And maybe that means getting their peers involved. Maybe that means, you know, a social media intern to kind of run this or, or the quarter sheets like I just showed um, where we're just leaving them in different places for folks to pick up. Um, but we have to do the marketing, you know, like it, it takes, it's going to take uh, that extra step from us because we won't find that student and, and, and hopefully we can find them before it's too late, but we just can't sit by, we have to do something. Great. Um, the next question is, how should we program, celebrate, or showcase these students, I am assuming she's talking about first generation, uh, without making them feel tokenized? Yeah. Oh, yes. Um, I think number one, asking my campus, and I saw Marissa here earlier, um, does a great job with our first generation, um, be first uh, group for students, but like with the many identities that I was uh, speaking about um, during uh, this talk, there are a lot of students who don't share and they don't have to share. We do not list who the first generation students are. We do not list who the EOP students are. If I take a picture, I have permission from those students to use that photo. Um, as, as students step into those identities, I think it becomes a little easier, but yeah, I, I, yeah, that's a good one. I don't know if Marissa is here and would like to share from the Be First Committee. She is here. Marissa, <laughs> would you like to tackle? So the question is, how do we help them not feel tokenized? Is that the question? Yes. Yeah. That's a that's a tough one because what I'm learning in my work, oh, I don't have a video. What I'm learning in my work is that um with low income students, not first gen students, is that not everybody has a pride in this identity. There is a great shame in it as well, um, because they feel othered already. But I think honestly, the best thing to help people not feel tokenized is to connect them with mentors who share that identity to help them build that that pride and that identity so that they know that they're not becoming tokenized because they have a community behind them. Um, that's why we built like a mentorship program because mentorship really helps with that. But it's it's hard because you can't, you can bring the horse to water, but you can't, you know, help them. I can't change someone's perspective because it's all unique. Um, so some of them may feel tokenized in, in, in every aspect of the way. Um, Oftentimes, um, it's an invisible identity, so it's it's even hard to to recognize it. It's even hard for students to to know it's an identity even exists. Mm -hmm. So I think step one is even <laughs> for students who are first gen learning that they're first gen, um, and then uh, gaining pride in that identity. And sometimes that takes the entire four years that they're here. Yeah, or longer. Like for me. I was in grad school. I actually did not know I was first generation until I worked for EOP <laughs> as a senior, as an undergraduate. I was like, oh, that's that's me. <laughs> right, right, right. And there's some power in that, like she said, like because you're recognizing community. So it's not just you. There are so many people who are who are here with you and um, they share this identity and, you know, and, and there's there's power in that. Yeah, it's also helpful to to educate people who aren't first gen, and that's why I'm glad people are here today, because when, um, so they don't make assumptions on what first gen is. Um, so what we're going to be doing next week as B first is we're going to hand out 
Valentine's Day cards to that are empowering to first gens, but we also have Valentine's Day cards called Fall in Love with First Gens for non-first gen students where they have factoids on the back of them. And a lot of times people make assumptions on first gens being lost and confused and there's negative ones, but we put purposefully like powerful ones like first gens are busy. Most first gens pull down two jobs while we're while going to school full time. So just kind of correcting the assumptions made on first gens can help with that too. Mm -hmm. I'll be quiet. Thank you, Marissa. Thanks, Marissa. Uh, we have a couple more. We'll see if we can get at least this one more in uh, from Lewis. He says, can you speak about ways that can be replicated to acknowledge and celebrate the achievements of students, faculty, and staff? So a little bit of a twist there. Okay. Can you speak about ways where we can celebrate faculty, students, and staff first? Acknowledge and celebrate the achievements of our students, faculty, and staff. Yes. Okay. Um, number one was the example of uh, the professor who put the photo up in the hallway. Like, I think that's a great, a uh, grand gesture. Um, I think other ways that we do in our office um, acknowledging students is um, we have a recognition ceremony. Um, to acknowledge the, the um, successes and achievements of our students. We have a newsletter that sort of goes out electronically um, weekly to our students, um, just highlighting what's happening for the week, who did something great. Like, you know, those are, those are, those are messages with, that you don't have to do much for. You could program it and schedule it and let it just run. And so we do that in our office, kind of sharing good news with, with um, all of our folks. We do an alumni um, newsletter where students are telling their stories of like what they've done after graduation. And like we are mass marketers sending that all over the place, all over the campus so that our students see it too. And then they're able to reach out and like, oh, this is exactly what I want to do. We have other avenues to connect students to potential mentors as well um, through our alumni engagement and uh, career development center. Um, so, so getting several departments involved in doing this work together is fantastic. I can remember that um, our um, alumni of color, um, uh, we have alumni of color affinity group who does a lot of this work also. So they're gathering in places and inviting students to participate in those gatherings that are across the state, wherever, wherever it is that they are. Um, to, to share, to advance that information. We have some of our uh, alum who are participating on the overall board because they want to, to be examples for the students who are coming up that, you know, you are this, you are this for life, right? And we need you to be engaged in this so that, so that the younger students will see you. But I think all of that is extremely promising and sort of like getting the idea out. Like these are, these are your classmates, these are your workmates. Like, these, this is the, the first generation force that is here and productive in all of these many ways and impacting the world, the cities and the regions that you live in, right? And, and we share that and we're doing grand things. I think, it, I think it truly is getting the message out there, these successes and, and those challenges, right? Because we know that our students are gonna face those as well. We're telling true stories. Well, Karima, we are just about at time. Um, I hope that everyone enjoyed the conversation. It looks like from the chat that people have enjoyed all the things that you've shared with us today. Uh, we do have an evaluation. We'd love for you to um, share your thoughts. Uh, we're gonna have a link in the chat and also we'll encourage, uh, we'll include that in the recording uh, email that will go out. So we'd love to hear from you. Um, we do have more sessions lined up. Uh, please uh, feel free to visit the website and continue to register for those sessions. The next one is uh, February 23rd, I believe, and we'll be talking about uh, veterans and military affiliated students. Um, so be sure to join us for that. Uh, Cheryl, did you have anything else you wanted to add before we end? 
No, I just wanted to thank Karima so much for that wonderful presentation. Um, this was a great way to kick off our webinar series. Karima, you've set the bar high. I'm not surprised. You always do. This was great. Um, thank you all for your time and attention, and I hope you'll join us for the, the remaining five. Thank you so much.